Welcome to The Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. As the name suggests, we are reading through the books of our favorite author, Patrick O'Brien, in specific, the Aubrey Matron series here. You're with Mike and Ian. And we are right in the middle of The True Love slash Clarissa Oaks or Clarissa Oaks slash The True Love. We'll try to be you know, <laughs> a fairly even playing field here. Ian, can you catch us up on where we were and where we're going? With pleasure, Mike. No problem. Uh, last time in Chapter 3, Stephen had been getting troubled by the letters that he's received in this big new mail delivery from home, from Diana. Jack was taking care of his business by offering two Church of England benefices to Martin. Clarissa's harsh, what you might call her Medea side, had been stopping people asking deep questions about her past. And another kind of examination had been underway. Stephen had medically examined Clarissa, but couldn't be sure what was wrong with her. Meanwhile, more and more people were seeming to be getting drawn towards Clarissa. Davidge and Stephen had even come close to dueling territory over her. A swordfish, we learned, laden with symbology and metaphor, had pierced the surprise's side. Davis harpooned it, brought it aboard just in time for it to be claimed by the gun room for the wedding feast. So, Mike, here we are in Chapter 4, and just as we get to Guy Fawkes time of year, it's that feast in the gun room. The long-delayed party for the bride and groom is getting underway. We are going to discover some Latin Easter eggs with the help of our new consulting medieval Latinist. Jack is going to learn the disastrous effects of too much pudding and start to realise and say out loud what he thinks is really going on with the gun room. So, Mike, lots of interpersonal drama this week. I think lots of deep, dark doings and realisations coming to the surface here. But it all begins in the water, right? It it does all begin in the water. As you know, we know that Jack's in a good place when he's off for a swim. And he is. Yeah. He's off for a swim while Stephen has said, you know, I, I have claimed dibs on the swordfish. I'm doing my dissection here. And Poolings is a little worried. He's saying, you know, doctor, it's a saluting day, so you can have the deck for 30 minutes, and then you got to get it all out of here. Stephen immediately recruits Padine and Sarah and Emily to help him, and not only to help him with the dissection, but to fend off all these members of the crew who are waiting to get their hands on these fresh pieces. They want it out of this warm temperature as quickly as possible. Poolings is working hard both to get the gun room's wedding feast organized and to prepare the ship for this 5th of November celebration that you mentioned, Ian. Yeah, so as this is all going on, we get back into one of O'Brien's favorite means of exposing kind of character drama and, and what's going on in people's minds. We get into epistolary mode. Stephen's back in his cabin, continuing his letter to Diana. And we, we're going to read some pieces of the letter out because he does a really nice job of telling us what he thinks is going on. My dearest love, writes Stephen, when I was a child, and had to have my paper ruled for me, I used to begin my letters with, I hope you are quite well. I am quite well. There, the muse would often leave me. Yet even so, as a beginning, it has its merits. I hope you are very well indeed, and as happy as ever can be. And it's very touching, this little reference all the way back to Stephen in childhood or young adulthood. He's feeling a little bit childlike. I think he's feeling at a bit of a loss. Doesn't know really what to say about Diana, given the very confusing picture he's got from her so far in the letters, all the things that he suspects about what could be going on at home with Diana and with their new daughter. He doesn't want to upset her, but he does want to send his very best wishes. So it's touching that he falls back on this very kind of childlike formulation here. He goes on and tells Diana more about Mrs. Oaks. And Mike, Mike, this is the first of two perspectives on Mrs. Oaks that we're going to get in this chapter. This is Stephen writing to Diana, describing her as having a natural grace. And he compares the natural grace to Diana as herself. He says that her complexion suffers, but he, Stephen, hopes that the complexion will get better with treatments. He describes her face as being like an amiable cat, always exhibiting modest, open and friendly expressions, eager for what he calls downright affection or at least general liking. And Stephen goes on to share that he's noticed that Clarissa's not getting inquired into any longer, maybe because she's shown her kind of a cold and harsh side here. No one questions her about her past anymore. There's no question of guilt or reprobation. She's part of the, the shipboard family now. 
And people seem to like her because she shows a genuine interest in naval actions. She's good at carrying on some companionable conversation. And Stevens qualifies this by saying she, she's not a bar bleu, not a blue stocking, meaning that she's not a, a woman with literary or intellectual interests. You know, she's not an, not an academic type. So even though she's not one of those blue stocking types, she never interrupts. She's always civil. And he says, is in general much less aware of her sex than those she is with. Mm. And that's Stephen kind of microscopically understating the case here, I think. Yeah, Stephen says that she isn't mannish, but she's as comfortable a companion as a man. Interesting thing here. Mm. And Diana, Stephen says, may say that that's because Stephen is no Adonis. He's no handsome young man. But Stephen says, you know, I, I, I beg to differ that she's really that same way around handsome men, too, like Jack and Davidge, as well as around people even less lovely than Stephen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like Tom Pullings, you know, thinking about that sword gash on his face or West, who's got the mortified nose. You know, it's been frozen off. And Martin with his one eye. They all receive the same friendliness that Stephen receives, that Jack and Davidge receive. Although he notes that Martin has seen her Medea side, that cold side of the moon, because of his inquiries. So t- tell us about Adonis. I'm kind of familiar with Adonis as being a, a general purpose term for somebody who's good looking and kind of knows it. Is there something for us to dig into there? Well, it's interesting. In, I, I really scratched my head on this, wondering how much O'Brien wants us to unpack here, because... We've got Adonis, Greek mythology, the mortal lover of Aphrodite. We have a Shakespearean poem that was wildly popular at the time. So could be there, but kind of has dropped out of sight a little bit now. There are some homoerotic elements to the Adonis story here. And we get even back, you know, some of you uh, from, from sort of the Christian or Hebrew tradition might think of Adonai, the Lord, Mm-hmm. Um, Adonis actually, you know, comes from that same root, and the whole Aphrodite Adonis thing has been thought to have been picked up almost in whole cloth, and then you know rewritten with their names slightly changed for Greek mythology from uh, a Near Eastern influence on Greek culture in the eighth century. As, as one scholar said, the special function of the Adonis legend is an opportunity for the unbridled expression of emotion in the strictly circumscribed life of women coming from this Near Eastern influence on Greek culture. So fascinating. It's like, okay, women were sort of really shoehorned into this way. And this whole Adonis, Aphrodite thing kind of gives them a different thing because there was a huge celebration around this in Greek culture where women would kind of beat their breasts, rend their clothes, plant these special flowers named after Adonis. So a lot to go into. Don't know whether it was just the handsome and not handsome issue yeah. or whether, as O'Brien so often does, he's sort of bringing us this really interesting perception into the emotional and, and actual life of women here. Ah, put a pin on that. I think we'll see more of it. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, it seems to me that the, the, a very 21st century term for what Adonis offers to women in Greek mythology and maybe what we're going to be talking about with Clarissa Oaks is agency. You know, she's yes. not a, she's not a female character who lacks agency, and we're going to see how that plays out and where that might come from. But that's been common, I think, for Diana and for Louisa Wogan and for Sophie. They've all been characters that have been in, in charge, at least to, to some extent at some times, of their fate and have had the chance to, to carve their own path out. Nice. Huh. Anyhow, we're, we're still with Stephen, and he's talking about this characteristic of Clarissa Oaks. He's struggling to put it into words, I think, in some ways. He worries in his letter to Diana that some men, and I think he's excluding himself here, at least in in how he describes himself to Diana, some men, but not him, might mistake her unguarded friendliness in a way that's perhaps not wise or kind. He says men often misinterpret this, especially from someone who's seen as having had a bad reputation in the past. Stephen goes further. He calls out his friend Jack. This is, again, Stephen writing confidentially to Diana says, Jack is not insensitive to her charms and keeps very aloof and was so worried about the possible effect on Stephen, this is Jack, um, that he had recited the sonnet that begins The Expensive Spirit and ends with All this world well knows, but none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. And Jack had recited this 
in a very kind of stern, hieratic voice to Stephen. In his deep voice, he described it better than I thought he could possibly have done. And Stephen quotes a little bit more from the sonnet. He says, the words savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust echoed strangely in my mind. And Mike, th this is Shakespeare's sonnet 129 about the, the, the physical and physiological devastation of lust. And it strikes really, really deeply into what we're talking about here, doesn't it? Oh, it, it really does. I mean, this is uh, this is a really, I, I have to admit, I, I was unfamiliar with sonnet 129. I wish I had had it tattooed early in my life. So <laughs> along the line here, it just goes over and over again about the shame and the wretchedness of lust, about the before, during, and after, about all the corrupting roles that it plays and how even in that moment of pleasure is so quickly, you know, there's this shift in mood right after here. And it's, you know, it's written as if it's from a man who's kind of looking back at an act of love with bitter fury at this contrasting aspect. Uh, some of Wikipedia's descriptions say it, you know, it begins with a howl of disgust <laughs> and, you know, has lists all these negative aspects of lust in anticipation, how, you know, kind of false we can be, how we go against logic and rationality. It causes people to be dishonest and brutal and shameful and cruel and savage here. And I can't help but think, you know, when I read through this and, and what it means, I remember back, and I, I don't know if the UK had anything like this or not, Ian, but we would go in school to these assemblies. And one day it's all the guys in this room and all the girls in that room. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're being told to make sure to lift up the toilet seat before we pee. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, we spent an hour on this. I think, you know, I think we got this. <laughs> what we didn't know at the time was that the women, you know, the girls uh, were all learning about menstruation. And of course, we couldn't hear about that just as, you know, they, they certainly already knew about toilet seats and peeing. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I hear from some, some of my female friends that they don't. They could Really? Oh, I've never heard that. But, no, yeah. <laughs> In any event, I wish, I wish we had used some of that time, perhaps with all of us together, to go over this sonnet and to learn at a younger age that, uh, yeah, we all, you know, we can hold each other accountable. We know how this is going to turn out and we chase that lust out. Don't, oh, don't wow. do it. Shall we have a little burst of it? Oh, whoa, what a fabulous idea, Ian. Well, with a big thank you to John Ricchetti, A.M. Rosenthal Professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania. Here is his reading of the sonnet. Sonnet number 129. The expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action. Until action, lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame. Savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust. Enjoyed no sooner, but despise it straight. Past reason hunted and no sooner had. Past reason hated as a swallowed bait on purpose laid to make the taker mad. Mad in pursuit and in possession so, had having and in quest to have extreme, a bliss in proof, and proved a very woe. Before a joy proposed, behind a dream. All this the world well knows, yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. Wow. wow. He's pretty good, this Shakespeare guy. <laughs> uh, he really is. He really is. Again, boy, teach us some of this early on. I like yeah. this. <laughs> I'm sure it's much better now, at least in terms of sex education, but I'm not sure they get Sonnet 129. <laughs> but, but maybe they should. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think this is a lot better than just say no. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. If you want to hear more from John Ricchetti, um, you can go and find his sonnet readings and lots more readings of classic poetry by going to writing.upen.edu, that's U-P-E-N-N -N dot E-D-U, and look for the Classics Collection. Well, we're almost done with this first bout of letter writing here. Stephen signs off saying that he's going to meet Clarissa for an appointment. And for such a good start to this part of his ongoing letter home, it doesn't seem to be entirely the best finish to say, OK, I'm now going to go talk to this woman that I've raised all your suspicions about, who seems to be capable of generating attraction in the most indifferent looking man. Anyhow, this does give us some great insights into the story and into what might be going on and what's happening in different characters' minds. 
the consultation takes place and we're not with it immediately in the first person all the way through. We kind of pick up the story as it's wrapping up. Stephen says he's found no improvement or deterioration in Clarissa's condition. He's surprised again that she doesn't seem bothered about nakedness. He says that, you know, she was just like a professional painter's model as she stepped out of and then back into her clothing. And before leaving, Clarissa asks Stephen if he can arrange to have her seated next to Martin at the gunroom dinner. She, she says, had pushed his kitten off her lap, perhaps a little harder than usual, and had answered Martin's following string of questions rather sharply. And she lays out this very sort of disingenuous and kind of innocent sounding um, explanation for why she's asking for this help. I'm afraid he may think I am still cross. But what is worse, the wretched creature disappeared last night and he may possibly imagine that I threw it overboard. Please, would you seat him next to me at dinner? I should be so sorry if we were not friends. Ha ha ha, Mike, I think I believe that the kitten's gone. And I think I believe it probably wasn't Clarissa, at least where we are now in understanding her character. But it does make me speculate who else might have taken a dislike to Martin and Martin's conduct so to such a great extent that the kitten got offed. Yeah, I you know it's it's funny. I, I just heard that you know that sound effects from Psycho in the stabbing tower <laughs> scene, read, 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 you know somehow when she was like, and he may have thought that I threw it overboard. I was like, who says stuff like that, right? Mm. But oh, but maybe to your point, maybe she has some idea about who did. Okay, but yeah, this is yeah, this was this was a little scary vibe a little turn in the story for me i was like whoa wait a minute this is serious stuff here so here's it so either she did it and she's putting on this kind of little girl patter to make her give her an innocent kind of gloss for it or maybe we're just learning that she's got relatively little filter about what other people will right. find creepy or disgusting and oh, she's, she just kind of lays it in there and like let's wait and see how her character evolves as I sit here right now, I'm not entirely sure thinking ahead where this is going to go, whether she has any more encounters with small animals. Mm. We'll see. <laughs> anyway, the, the encounter wraps up. Uh, we hear that Stephen, feeling that his eyes might betray his reflections, looked down and said in a neutral voice, I have no say in these things. Pullings is the president of our mess, but I will mention it to him if you choose. Mm. <sighs> Already feeling uneasy about this feast, Mike, and st starting to wonder what's going to be in the fricassee. Right, right, right. <laughs> That's right. Don't ask. <laughs> oh, Reed knocks on the door and and tells the doctor that uh, you know, with the captain's compliments, he's got five minutes to change if he wants to see the ceremony. So we're still, you know, we're here on fifth of November here. Interestingly, when Clarissa asks Reed if Mister Oakes is on deck. Reed answers her without looking at her or smiling. And he usually has this, you know, look of open adoration for her. And Stephen and Clarissa are both so surprised that they, you know, the text says they give Reed a quick penetrating glance. Uh, so, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of wondering about this here. So Jack has thought about her in the past. Stephen's just written about her effect on people. And now clearly she's had a very strong effect on Reed. But Reed is now kind of going in an opposite direction. Mm. So up on deck, Stephen finds the ship is completely cleaned and incredibly well decorated. Everybody's dressed in their finest clothes. And at noon, the people run up the shrouds out on the yards and Jack starts three cheers for the king. Pullings reminds the distracted Stephen to pull off his hat and to, to join the Jose <laughs> and the entire crew. Everybody is cheering away. The three cheers die off, except that Sarah and Emily continue saying, Jose, Jose for Guy Fox, you know, and they go on and on <laughs> until Jemmy Duck stops them. And Ian, as, as we know, uh, Guy Fox probably wasn't the guy everybody was saluting here, right? Well, no, he's he's the anti-hero of the story. The, the Guy Fawkes Day, as it's called, 5th of November, actually commemorates the, the trial and execution of the gunpowder conspirators who plotted to blow up Parliament. So Guy Fawkes Day isn't really a day in honour of Guy Fawkes. It's a day in honour of the fact that him and his co-conspirators were executed and burned, which is why we still bizarrely and grotesquely in England still burn an effigy of Guy Fawkes on a bonfire on the 5th of November with no notion of just how... How offensive that is. Anyhow, Jose for Guy Fawkes is a very cute and adorable 
complete misunderstanding of the situation here. Right, right. And this is the guy that brings us fireworks like Santa brings yeah. us Christmas. I mean, come on now. Yeah. Well, luckily, Jimmy Ducks shushes them, and then the gunner fires off the salute. They wrap that up, and, you know, the crew and the gunner and his mates all head to dinner here. Yeah. And it's shaping up pretty well, this dinner. Stephen's donated 24 bottles of pale sherry to the gun room feast, even though it's sherry that's gone around the world a couple of times. He gives them tips on decorating the room. He passes on this request from Clarissa to Pullings about seating. And we get this impression that all, all of his little assistances and helps and requests are seen in rather bad light by the gun room who go, for God's sake, doctor, go look at some birds. Go find an albatross. And so having retreated from the gun room, he goes and finds Jack, who's soaking his foot in his cabin and asks if he's suffering. And Jack says, do you remember back um, when uh, I stood on the dumb chalder trying to clear the nutmeg's rudder? And Stephen says, well, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I think of the dumb chalder constantly, rarely far from my mind, which is a really funny little recollection of how Stephen teases Jack about just how obscure some of all of this jargon is. We'll come back to what the dumb chalder is in a second. But Jack says he was injured when he had hit his foot on this thing called the dumb childer, hitting his ankle in the place where he has also now just this minute hit it again. And it's really, really sore. Stephen examines the ankle and says, this is a small piece, a small bony fragment of the external malleolus trying to come out. And Jack has no clue what an external malleolus is. And he says, well, Jack, if uh, if you can oppress me with dumb childers, I can do the same with malleoli. So good for you, Stephen. He offers to whip out a lancet and just make a little incision in the side of the joint there, take it out in the seaweed that he'd used to decorate the table. <laughs> and Jack really hates the idea of being cut in cold blood, really hates the idea of anything, and suddenly dresses this up and goes, actually, now it's feeling much better. I'm going to explain myself away from the situation by saying, now I've put this thing in salt water. It's much better. So can I, let me just dig into the uh, the jargon here. There's... A score for each side. There's a score for the Jack Aubrey side. A dumb chowder is a cleat or block bolted to the after side of a rudder post, a rudder post being the, the, the piece of timber in the ship's frame that the rudder is attached to. And this metal cleat or block is where the end of a rudder pintle rests on. The pintle is a pin-shaped fitting that sits on the rudder. So like the, the, the corner of a hinge, if you like. The purpose of the dumb chowder is to relieve the gudgeon or the rudder braces of some of the weight of the rudder. So it's to kind of support the gravity on the rudder. An external malleolus is both a nice piece of anatomy and also a nice piece of historical mise-en-scene, if you like. This particular usage of, of malleolus, in particular the external malleolus, turns out to be a, a real 1800s authentic medical term. We look in Google Ngram and we, look, we see that external malleolus had a big peak in the early 1800s and then dropped out of usage as the 20th century came along. These days, ankle fractures and ankle injuries are still are described in relation to this structure of the malleolus, which is the bony kind of knobbly piece that sticks out either side of the ankle. But the external malleolus is called the lateral malleolus these days. And its opposite partner on the inside of your ankle is the medial malleolus. Um, it's still a really painful place to get whacked. It's still a, probably a pretty typical place for you to end up with a little bony splinter or something if you've had an injury in the past. Uh, and I can just imagine it makes Jack feel unaccountably um, irritated and annoyed and distracted. Given that we're not going to do this surgery at the moment, they continue yeah. to talk. And Stephen's a little surprised that the gunner has the watch. And, and the gunner has the watch so everybody else at the gun room can go have this feast here. And Jack says, well, it is unusual on a frigate, but very typical on a sloop, you know, which is, you know, the captain is a, is a lieutenant. So, And he tells Stephen that, you know, here on the surprise, they have this embarras de joie. And Stephen doesn't, uh, you know, pay any attention to it. Jack says it again. And Stephen finally says, you know, well, I'm, I'm sure of it. And Jack explains that so many of the Shelmerstonians understand navigation and have actually commanded their own vessels. He says that even if the whole quarter deck were wiped out, they could still carry the barky home. Mm -hmm. And Stephen thanks Jack and says, you know, that is a great comfort to me. I, I think I'm going to go off and read a little bit. And, you know, it's funny because I, I I was a little bit thinking, why are we why are we talking about this? This, you know, is this O'Brien, you know, sometimes even if the whole quarter deck were wiped out, that would be a little ominous. But given what else is happening in this chapter and the quarter deck is about to assemble in the gun room, maybe the quarter deck being wiped out 
isn't as far off as we think it might be here. No, maybe not. And Mike, this strikes me as a bit of a Patrick O'Brien theme. He's quite happy often to let the officers fall out, especially Marines. Right. <laughs> Marine officers tend to be the ones that fall out. But he often likes to make sure that the non-commissioned officers, the warrant officers, are seen as the ones who are kind of steadying things. And they're the old kind of familial hierarchy of the trades that keep the Royal Navy going. So I think it's really nice of him to remind us that even though there's this tension between the officers, actually the petty officers in this case, the gunner and his mate, are all capable of taking care of the ship and the officers maybe should, uh, yeah, get over themselves a little bit. It, it is nice to have this embarrassment of choices. Well yeah. done. Good. And, um, and, and maybe there's a link there to who, who else has an embarrassment of choices. Jack doesn't have very much choice. Stephen doesn't have very much choice, but I think Clarissa Oakes is faced with an embarrassment of choices. She's got a whole range. Besides her newly acquired husband, she's got a whole range of offers of male company to choose from. And I wonder how that's going to work out. Boy, that's a great point. Well, Stephen said he's going to go off and do this reading. And in his reading, Stephen's consulting a number of medical experts. He's got all these books spread out. And he notes that they have a lot to say about men, but very little about women, other than agreeing that there's no diagnosis more difficult than a deep-seated atypical chronic infection. So again, O'Brien just sort of drops in here this, you know, something's wrong with Clarissa. We don't know what it is. Ah, there's, you know, maybe this is some deep-seated atypical chronic infection. And and I do remember, Mike, when we were at the museum in Greenwich looking at Northcott's marine practice, there wasn't very much on female anatomy in there. And I'm pretty sure that if Stephen is leafing through Northcott's marine practice, he's not getting very much help on the finer points here. I'll bet. So Stephen goes to join his messmates in the gun room as the crowd is gathering here for the dinner. Pullings is really glad to see him. He's afraid that they might have lost him, almost as they had almost lost Davidge, who, in Pullings' report, had tumbled down a ladder. And Martin, on the other hand, who we learn had, according to some, fallen out of the top. It's a little bit of a mystery why all these members of the gunroom should be explaining away falls that they've had lately. We'll come back to that later, because for now, Stephen's admiring the table, having given advice on it earlier on. Pullings reviews the seating. They've placed the bride on Pullings' right, Pullings being president of the mess, president of the gun room. Then Martin and then Stephen read Adams is at the foot. We've got the captain on Pullings' left and then the other officers, the lieutenants rather, Davidge, West and Oakes sitting on Adams' right. And we get a little foreshadowing of what's going on here. People keep turning to Davidge and asking if he's all right. And Stephen notices a dark swelling on the left temple of Davidge's cheekbone. And maybe you get a couple of moments as a reader to speculate on what might be going on with Davidge and the tumble down the ladder and the blow to the head. But straight away, Martin comes in and says, Stephen, don't don't beat me. I've seen your bird. He's seen this bird, Nathan's albatross, which is described as being yellow with a blue-tipped bill, a strong, dark eyebrow, a confiding expression, and black feet. And Stephen comments that ah, no one had ever said the world was fair um, he, and that he is sorry to hear that Martin had come out at the top. And I've got to say, Mike, compared to the Stephen of earlier chapters, he's in pretty good form here. He's not doing any kind of barbed comments or sarcasm. He's quite happy to accept Martin's uh, little apology here. And Martin turns straight back and says, this, this story about him having fallen out of the top was base slander, he said. He'd only had a trifling slip. He could have come down unaided if it wasn't that one of the Sethians there, John Brampton, had had grabbed him. Well, we don't get to see how far this particular thread of conversation goes because next into the gun room come the Oakses and the dinner finally starts after Stephen compliments the bride on her scarlet gown. And Mike, that gown in the context of all this blue, we're not going to be let to forget it, are we? No, no, no. Here we go. We've got it back again. Now, the dinner becomes unusually quiet very quickly. It's clear that Davidge and West have not held back their ill feeling towards each other, even though the captain's there, and they don't say a word. Oakes is completely mute, and O'Brien writes with a dogged look on his pale face. Reed is only saying yes, sir, and no, sir, and looks very sad. Martin is reserved, but you know, perfectly correct towards Clarissa, 
And the only conversation seems to be coming from Stephen and Adams and occasionally Wes talking about swordfish, while at the other end of the table, Jack and Pullings, you know, with occasional asides to Clarissa, are talking about Mediterranean tunny or tuna fish. Mm. So, you know, a couple of small conversations about fish. You know, this is the big bridal feast and, and it's not not going well here, right? No, it's not. So at the next remove, Jack and Stephen are both independently reflecting in their own minds about how much ordinary dinner table conversation is really questions or implied questions. You know, people asking each other, you know, were you ever at or do you know? And they realize these would offend Clarissa or their personal recollections, which, you know, people at the table have shared, but she wouldn't have shared in because she's not been a member of this crew in a long time. And Stephen, Jack, and especially Pullings are all feeling the awful approach of silence. Mm. Now, Jack tries his a glass of wine with you, which is infallible, but not very long lasting. West, thank goodness, adds some prepared remarks on swordfish. And then Stephen, you know, kind of trying to pull some conversation about out of people, gets Weed and Oaks to talk about a mummified swordfish head that they'd seen in a Sydney apothecary shop. Now, thankfully, Clarissa has overcome Martin's reserve and the two are now talking away at a great rate. So we're at this dinner. It hasn't started off well Clearly, something's going on, and we're not quite sure what it is. I think like Jack and Stephen, we're we're scratching our heads a little bit. Maybe maybe a good time for some of that sherry that Stephen's donated to this dinner. Oh, Mike, I'm with you. Let's go grab ourselves a glass, and uh, let's come back after a short break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole welcome back from the break we were talking just before the break about the awkward silence descending on this dinner party as any self-respecting am radio dj knows dead air is bad air and there was a big threat of some dead air settling over this conversation but thankfully conversation broke out thanks to clarissa and she and martin have been talking away at a great rate she says that she had been about to tell mr martin about the participation of lieutenant west in the battle of the glorious first of june which we'll come back to And she asks Mr. West then if he'll tell the story. And West at first kind of demurs and he says, well, everybody knows the story. And Stephen says, well, I don't. And Reed might not because he wasn't born yet. And this all seems quite friendly. And West says, "Okay, I'll give the outlines of the battle for the benefit, he says, just the general lines for those who weren't born yet or who have never seen a fleet action. And this is already a bit of a sign of some bad feeling. That was a bit of a swipe. At Davidge, who hadn't really seen very much action aboard ship until Jack had taken him aboard. There's no response from Davidge, who just sits there and drains his wine glass. And uh, we get the beginning of this very long story of the Battle of the Glorious First of June that actually began the previous month in May 1794 as the Channel Fleet under Earl Howe, with 49 men of war and 99 merchant ships from multiple convoys, had gathered together. And at that very large number of ships clarissa was really really thrilled she clapped her hands and said glorious think about 148 sailor ships together and this is just the right thing for her to do this nice little innocent encouragement egging on of west here as the story continues the convoys and the accompanying men of war had split off between one thing and another lord howe had headed off with 26 ships of the line and seven frigates hunting for the french fleet first of all in brest and then out at sea after they learned that the French had got out in thick weather. And Lieutenant West had been a youngster on Admiral Howe's flagship, the Queen Charlotte, as all this was going on, which is how he got to give a first-person account here. They spotted the French off and on from the 28th of May onwards, but no fleet action was really joined until the 1st of June, the name of the battle. And as the Admiral signals to attack the enemy's centre for him to pass through and engage them to lure, just as that signal is mentioned... Back in the real world of the gun room, the swordfish stakes arrive, not before time, as it turns out. So, Mike, the, the, the glorious 1st of June, I've heard Jack Aubrey mention it 
quite a few times. Do you, do you want to talk us through a little bit about the historical context to the Glorious First? Well, it, it, it's 1794, sometime called the Fourth Battle of Ushan. Yeah. It was the first and largest fleet action of the naval conflict between the Kingdom of Great Britain and the First French Republic during the French Revolutionary Wars. France had had a lot of things going on. The UK had had a lot of things going on. And this was the first time they're really together in kind of a fleet to fleet action here. Mm. We're going to hear some more about the action itself from West. So I don't know how much to say here about what happens as a result of that. But we do. It's one of the times when, and, and we'll see a little bit of this, when Hal, as the admiral, pushes sort of typical older strategy aside and takes a very different action in terms of this. So that that was kind of neat. Um, yeah. But maybe we'll we'll hear a little bit more from Wes telling here. It's interesting to keep track of some of the tension that's going on around this story, though. Clarissa has set a little bit more bad feeling in train here in what was a probably very you know, very innocent and very socially adept thing to do to keep the conversation going by asking Wes to tell a story that she knows is home territory for lots of people around the table. But already with this needle between Davidge and West, we're seeing that there's a cost to her presence here. Now, as this is going on, Stephen watches Martin, the anatomist, getting hold of some particularly tender pieces of swordfish steak for Mrs. Oaks. He sees Reed refilling and draining his glass every time the wine is in reach. So there's something not right with Reed. Pullings offers to refill Clarissa's glass, and she's taking it easy. She says she wants only, only wants half a glass, and she wants to hear the rest of the story. And at first, West again offers to sort of brush it off and says, I've been talking for a long time. But he picks the story up anyway. And picking up the story of this encounter between the British and the French fleets, how having set off towards the French line wanted to take advantage of the professionalism of his officers and crews. Again, this makes it a well-chosen anecdote for Royal Navy guys because they can they can talk about this with pride. This all being the case because the French Navy at this point had lost lots of experienced officers and crewmen in the revolution, as Olivier Aronda had said to us uh, a couple of months ago. And he was therefore able to use the weather gauge to attack the French fleet directly. And summarizing here, West says that some ships followed the orders, some ships didn't, but in the end, it was all one. He said, we took six of them, sunk one, crippled many more, and lost none of our own, although it was nip and tuck at times, they fighting with such spirit. And Mike, what's really interesting is the turn that the story takes now. And We've heard this before. People who are at an action then start to give their own personal first-hand account, because what's been in the story so far has got everybody around the table who knows the naval history kind of nodding and they're all going yeah 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 that's how it was and then west takes this odd turn he reminds everybody that he had been the first lieutenant's runner aboard this ship so therefore serving on the quarter deck very close to admiral howe and gives some of his own personal stories about what went on with this slightly bizarre vignette of a scene between him and a gun crew and admiral howe himself really with kind of very cheesy, you know, bad Hollywood movie dialogue in which he's meant to be the one who shines the light on a mistake being made by the Admiral in the thick of it all, ends up with the Admiral wounding West by, we're told, hitting him on the head accidentally with a sword, and then embarrassingly and mistakenly ordering his crew to stop shooting at a ship that he thought was English but was in fact French. And in the version of the story, it's West who calls the Admiral out for his error and get some kind of recompense for it. And it's a very, very odd story. O'Brien tells us that as the veracity and the truthfulness leaves West's story, and as the ship heals more, so at the same time, everyone braces themselves except for young Reed, whose legs are too short to reach the stretcher under the table. And he slides under the table, his eyes shut, his face pale. And I think lots of people around the table, Mike, are thinking that Reed got a lucky escape here. Right, right, after this thing. And, you know, Jack's thinking, you know, he, he he realizes that Wes is making this up to impress Mrs. Oaks, and he doesn't mind the fiction. He's thinking in his own mind, except that it's so poor and way too long. Ian, I think this has got to be O'Brien, right, saying a little something to us. Yeah, a little meta joke here, because this we're now quite far along into O'Brien's celebrity phase as he's writing this. And he kind of knows that there are people out there who like picking up on the authenticity of his work and like praising up the the, the particular bits of artistic license that O'Brien takes in, in using historical accounts. 
and you know he's he's saying here that oh it's 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 okay to embellish history with fiction as long as you do a good job at it and he's kind of saying well poor quality fiction even if it's offered to tart up an otherwise uh, exciting occasion can be a waste of time so th- yeah. thank you patrick o'brien for reminding us of the risks of poor quality naval historical fiction you've just summarized 50 percent of the internet conversation and discourse about patrick o'brien in one sentence there so uh thank you patrick and uh, let's get back on with the story it, it is well done so, Jack, as we said, it's kind of like, OK, yeah, I understand why you're doing this, but it's enough. And he's relieved when this messenger appears from the quarter deck with a gunner's request to reduce sail. And Jack tells the gunner to use his own discretion. It's good, you know, good Jack management. And Jack tells the table that he's glad the ship's speed has picked up, that, you know, they've been so idle and so slow and there have been winds and the hands, he says, have been far too idle. And something slipped into his mind about Satan and idle hands, you know, a little phrase he'd learned from his youth. And he thinks to himself, not only the hands, neither, God damn the wicked dog. So I think Captain Aubrey has got a little bit of a point about the officers running through his head here. You know, we've all had a little bit too much time on our hands. And obviously he's starting to form an opinion that people have not been doing good things with that time. As a matter of fact, Jack is now thinking about how different the gun room is from the last time he'd been there. It's been some time ago and he doesn't know the causes, but he knows well the effects. Uh, As he says, the gun room as a civilized community was almost at an end. And Jack's thinking to himself, you know, without good feeling between the officers, there'd be no willing cooperation and the ship could therefore not be run efficiently. If there's ill blood in the wardroom or the gun room, That upsets the hands and all their individual loyalties to certain officers and warrant officers. And Jack sees this ill blood between West and Davidge, but the text says he sees a series of other currents that seem to affect pullings as well, and even Martin. So I think he's thinking, oh my gosh, this thing is just insidious across the whole gun room here. Now, Jack, you know, is kind of, uh, has, has been thinking about this. He's kind of getting back to the conversation a little bit, and he's glad to hear that there's a, a new flow of talk initiated by Mrs. Oaks, and he credits her with saving the feast because now even Davidge is talking. Yeah, and ma- maybe it's all going to be okay. Jack wonders as this is going on how the gun room had got this way. And as you said before, Mike, he's thinking about causes. He's thinking about remedies. He's still a little bit in the dark, well, quite a lot in the dark. He's listening to another urgent voice of another character in the story, which is the surprise, the ship in the background, because the wind is picking up. There's this more urgent sound from the ship. The sails are being taken in. He realizes, being distracted like this, that he's not being a good guest. So he tunes back into the conversation. And as, as often happens when you've been daydreaming and you tune back into a conversation, one sentence floats down the table that somebody else is saying. And this is Stephen who says, oh, Spartan dog more fell than anguish, hunger, or the sea. And besides being an interesting quotation that we'll get into in a second, that raises the question in Jack's mind, what's he talking about? He says, are you talking about income tax? Meaning to raise a bit of a laugh. And Stephen says, no, we're talking about duels. Mrs. Oakes had asked this question about whether the military code obliged the officer that had been beaten by Earl Howe in West Anecdote of a few moments ago to ask for satisfaction. I, I can almost imagine the kind of silence and the forks hitting the plates at this point. And Stephen quite innocently goes along and just examines this situation. He says, well, maybe the line would express the state of mind of a deeply injured, furious duelist when he plunges his sword into the opponent's bowels. And there's a, there's a long hyphen in the text here, Mike, but in my reading of it, this is a very, very, very long and awkward pause interrupted by may i cut you a trifle of pudding ma'am asks pullings moved by the association of ideas <laughs> and stephen and clarissa between them with their rather innocent perspectives and idle questions have really raised these tensions here raising the possibility of a duel again and stephen's not making that line up about the spartan dog that's a real quote right mike it is it's from shakespeare's othello act five scene two And and it has a character, Ludovico, addressing Iago. The Met Museum, and maybe we can put this out on the socials, has an etching 
of this scene, and their description of it says, here, Ludovico points to the tragic results of Iago's jealous manipulation, you know, which results in the death of the guiltless Desdemona, Emilia slain by Iago for revealing the truth, and Othello dying after stabbing himself in despair. So what we're getting at here is, you know, this whole effect of jealousy and manipulating, stirring up people's affections and everything. And I said earlier that after Martin's Cat, I had this little, you know, kind of vibe here. And and now I'm wondering, you know, Mrs. Oak stirring up this question about whether a duel is mandatory if one suffers a blow. You know, she says in, in the text that she has not lived out in the world very much when she was young and that she had these two fashionable pieces of wisdom, this one about dueling being one of them. And I've been wondering about damage falling down the ladder versus, you know, perhaps being hit by someone, that this being a conflict here. And now the suggestion that, you know, perhaps he should duel whoever hit him if, if in fact, he was hit. And so I suspect with all the jealousy, if he was hit, that the person who hit him is probably in the middle of this conversation. So I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, and then we've got this whole scene from Othello where, you know, these are the consequences of getting this kind of thing running like that. Uh, Thankfully, you know, O'Brien has provided a little bit of humor with Pulling's jumping to the pudding from the plunging sword here. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Well, invited to partake of the pudding. Clarissa does one one final little bit of misjudgment. She she ought to know that taking pudding on board is a, is a, is an important part of the etiquette of being at a gunroom dinner but she declines the pudding jack who feels the need to do her share of the eating for her says i'm going to honor the feast i'm going to take a third piece and realizes that for this particular pudding it might be more of a labor than a delight and some latin phraseology floats into his mind from his childhood and jack's thinking of this phrase non sum qualis eram now, Mike, we've got a lot of Latin to deal with in this chapter, and it turns out that the podcast now has a as a consulting Latinist and a medieval Latinist at that. And uh, tell us a little bit about our consulting Latinist. Let's give her a shout out and see what we can learn from what she's shared with us. Yeah, Karen Ruff was kind enough to contact us on Facebook Messenger, and she actually sent a correct Latin translation from one of our lines a few chapters ago about Jack's liver. We had grabbed the widely available internet translation of cogit amare jacur to mean the liver knows how to love. But Karen pointed the more accurate translation would be the liver compels one to love rather than knows how to love. And she said probably the mistake comes from this idea of knows cogit with think as in, you know, I think therefore I am. Mm. But cogit here is from kogo meaning compel. And Karen's translation is also referenced in an ancient source that's referenced in Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, which we've visited mm. several times in the canon so far. So An old favorite. Exactly. No fireside evening goes by without me turning a few pages of Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy. Right. I've got to tell you. Never far <laughs> from my mind. You know, this is never-ending book about why we get so down here. And we all know that Jack has a very compelling liver in the area of love. Oh, yes. has ever been so here. So, Karen, I, I asked her, I said, you know, gosh, this was great. I really appreciate it. Could you give us a little help on chapter four? Because we've got a little Latin to uh, unpack here, and she does here. Right. So as Jack realizes that his third piece of pudding is going to be more of a labor, he came up with this phrase, non sum qualis eram, drifting up from the remote years when he would have been flogged into at least a remote nodding acquaintance with latin as o'brien says the text goes on the rest he could not recall it might have had nothing to do with pudding at all but the effect was the same which is a nice little sounding joke but we could dig a little bit deeper into what this latin tag is and where it comes from karen thank you once again karen writes to us non sum qualis eram translates as i am not as i was it comes from horace's odes book four ode number one and like often happens with a little poetic reference or allusion from O'Brien. If you read backwards and read forwards and read the whole context, you see a lot more really interesting stuff when you read around. The ode begins, Venus long abandoned, do you stir up wars again? Spare me, I pray, I pray, I am not as I was. 
So thank you for that translation, Karen. The verse continues in a general term, says, go bother somebody younger. So this is a, a male character saying, Venus, now the, the, the God of love, don't bother me. I can't be doing with that. I don't have time for that these days. I'm too old and crusty. Now, interestingly, for our immediate Patrick O'Brien context, Horace then urges Venus to go off and bother a particular guy, somebody called Paulus Maximus, si terere ye curqueris idoneum. And I have no idea if my pronunciation is doing okay there or not. If you seek a suitable liver to burn, then go get Paulus Maximus's liver because he's the guy. And since we've had both liver, ye cur, and idoneus, the idoneum of that sentence there, appear in the last couple of chapters, we're getting more and more connections here between this little world of obscure Latin scholarship that Patrick O'Brien has dreamt up and the connections that we might be able to make from it. So Jack, it turns out, was right. It might well have had nothing to do with pudding at all, but the effect was indeed the same. The effect of eating pudding, in Jack's case, being the effect of aging that we're talking about here uh, between men. Yeah. <sighs> and, you know, Jack's thinking about this appetite for pudding, like you said. And, and Karen started thinking that O'Brien's thinking about his appetite for other things, which we're going to keep coming back to, too. I like that, yeah. too. So we've got this I'm... aging. We've got Jack's other appetites here. And... Yeah. You know, we've got this thing now going on where Jack's saying that this appetite of mine, what I desire, is perhaps becoming more of a labor than a pleasure for me, this pudding. But we're wondering if around this whole gun room, you know, what they desire is now becoming a little bit more of a labor than a pleasure yeah. for them. So, you know, again, well spotted Karen here. Well, yeah, it, thank you. Keep them coming. <laughs> but we're not finished yet. Jack asks Martin the Latin for the kind of pudding that they're currently eating. Martin doesn't know, and he asks Stephen, who replies, Sebi confectio discolore. And Karen's translation is suet, a, a confection that is something prepared and modeled. So a modeled confection of suet. Which she huh. writes is an accurate, if unappetizing, description of spotted dick. Yeah. And so I thought, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And I might add, you know, I hope I'm not taking this a step too far, that with all of Stephen's readings about a hard to diagnose chronic infection in women, a subject first raised when Martin was treating a venereal disease, perhaps spotted dick is another hint from O'Brien here. <laughs> Very good. M Mike, I often get reminded of Lobscouse and Spot the Dog and that I should go and dig out some more recipes. I'm getting another hankering now to go and uh, boil myself a suet pudding. Well done. Ah, very good. So time is passing and Davidge and Oaks realize that there's just a couple of minutes to go before it's their time to go up on deck and relieve the gunner. So we have to get some toasts out of the way before the party starts to break up here. Pullings, first of all, has everybody drink to the bride and groom. Everyone, including the servants, gives three Jose's for Clarissa and then for Oaks. Stephen and Padine treat Reed, who's sick and unconscious and sick with drink. And Stephen stays with Reed, passed out in his hammock. At one point, he hears Reed speaking in an incoherent way about Mrs. Oaks, how he had loved her so and how he's sure his heart must break. And as Stephen leaves, he's headed out of the midshipman's berth, which is right next to where the Oakses live. He notices out of the corner of his eye, in the darkness, someone in a dark coat slipping out of sight. And he realises as he climbs the ladder that in addition to not saying hello or asking about Reed, this person must have been standing against the forward side of the captain's pantry, staying hidden from the ladder rather than having walked through where they would have aroused no suspicion. So this is not just a chance encounter. This is an encounter with somebody who had a particular plan to be in that place and not be discovered. So, Mike, the, the plot is thickening here. I wonder what kind of plot it could be. Well, you know, and, and, and O'Brien is laying hints down everywhere. Yeah, uh, yeah. He says that as Stephen comes on deck, the surprise is capering like a wanton. Mm. Capering like a wanton the movement growing stronger. And you know, I'm thinking to myself, okay, wanton can refer to like a deliberate or unprovoked cruel or violent action, you know, maybe rocking violently, but it also refers very much to sexual immodesty or being promiscuous, especially when referring to women. 
Ian, you pointed out, and I had forgotten that, you know, in the very opening of the book where the yeah. ship's wake showed a wanton gripe, uh, you know, after coming about. And so, you know, we're getting this wanton theme, you know, that O'Brien keeps putting in here. Well, yeah. Stephen finds Jack. Jack's in the cabin. He says that a pot of coffee will be up soon if that wicked dog doesn't upset the kettle again. Jack asks after Reed, and the ship starts to jerk. Jack hollers out to Stephen to hold on to something, and, and then almost immediately easing Stephen into a chair, saying, God's my life, Stephen. You absolutely turned a somersault. I hope nothing is broke. Stephen says that without his wig, Martin would be treating a depressed fracture of the skull at the moment. Uh, and he comments on the ship's movement. And Jack says, well, you know, she'll do that sometimes with the wind and sea. And then adds, and the text says, there are all sorts of platitudes about ships being like women, unpredictable, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And so, again, I think O'Brien is laying it on pretty thick here. Yeah, and maybe there's a little contrast here. Stephen's a lubber, and even as a lubber, he manages to take a tumble in heavy weather and come away uninjured. We're meant to believe that Davidge had taken a tumble in mild weather and had yet even so copped a big old black eye or a big bruise on the side of his head. And I just think that we're invited to compare those two situations and see which one we think is more likely the correct explanation. Oh, yeah. Uh, anyhow, we're in the cabin here. Killick comes in with coffee. He fusses about Stephen's treatment of his new wig. Jack asks if Stephen wants to play backgammon after Jack comes back down from being on deck. He says it's going to be too rough for music. And Stephen is right there. He says, with all my heart. And we learned that they had been playing chess for years. They were both intense players, working hard, not wanting to lose, and were such close friends that remorse for beating the other sometimes outweighed the triumph of winning. And they'd played piquet, but Stephen was so lucky that they had decided instead on backgammon, which had just enough chance in it that you get some pleasure in the victory, but lots depends on the throw of the dice. So you can play and be at ease with each other and just follow the ebb and flow of random chance. Stephen has the heavy weather backgammon set. Who knew that there was such a thing as a heavy weather backgammon set, right? right. Um, all ready to go when Jack comes back into the cabin wet with dangling hair. He says the squall is going to last a while, but he's happy for it. He wants no idle hands, no goddamn mischief, as he calls it. And Mike, it, it's just occurring to me, as this conversation goes on, in the briefest of moments in passing, by the way, we learn that Martin had decided on these benefices, these uh, Church of England livings. He's decided to take the two immediately vacant benefices that Jack is offering. He's not going to wait for Yarel, the perhaps more valuable but currently occupied one. So somebody's been coalesced into some kind of decision making by some of what's going on in the ship. Yeah, there you go. Well, they're playing backgammon. Stephen tells Jack that his mind really is not in the game. And Jack says, yeah, he's stupider than usual because he thought and I always believed that there's room for pudding. And he took the third piece to compliment Tom, but that that slice is with him still. And Jack says, Mrs. Oaks really saved the dinner, you know, talking away in her good fashion and getting Wes to talk. And Stephen asks how much of West's account was historically accurate. And Jack says, well, most of the first part, except that he forgot to mention where the Charlotte had actually broken through the French line on the 28th earlier in an initial skirmish. But after that, it got very fanciful. And Jack says, but, you know, you know, men tell such things to ladies like that character in the play Venice Preserved. Yeah, a, a really interesting drop in there. Yet again, this is a chapter full of all kinds of literary Easter eggs. I'm like, Venice Preserved, I had no knowledge of until I started digging behind it. Venice Preserved is a restoration play uh, written by Thomas Otway, staged in 1682. And I had always had in my mind that the restoration plays are all comedies, you know, high spirits and low breaches, that kind of thing. But this is a really dark restoration play, a tragedy. It got revived many times during the 1830s. It's been revived in the 20th century. Um, the RSC has it in their repertoire right now. It's about secret marriages, rape, political intrigue, plotting against the government, not a million miles away from the thoughts of uh, November the 5th and the gunpowder plot, I guess. Not the pretty picture of things that we say to ladies that Jack portrays. Far from it. There's lots of kind of sexual tension here. There's lots about the vulnerability of women 
showing how little respect and honor and power they have, which again takes us back to the idea of uh, Adonis and Aphrodite. There's a female character in this play, Aquilina, who's more or less a prostitute who attracts the attention of many of the male characters too and gets some of her own agency to come back to this chapter's favorite words. And interestingly, in 1865, John Wilkes Booth used the play as a veiled allusion to his plot to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. So Venice Preserved is not something lighthearted. It's a dark, complex political intrigue charity. So we're not picking up a reference here to anything kind of lightweight and funny. Ah, true. Well, Jack had been telling Stephen about this pudding that's still with him. Hmm. Jack, you know, then they got onto this thing about Wes. And, you know, Jack makes this comment about, you know, what the things we tell ladies. Stephen doesn't respond to that at all. Jack tells him about the play. Jack's quiet. Stephen's quiet. And then after a while, he says, pudding. Sure, it starts with pudding or march pain. And then it's a toss of a coin, which fails first, your hair or your teeth, your eyes or your ears. And then comes impotence for age gelds a man without hope or reprieve, saving him a mort of anguish. And I, I wow. think I remember in, you know, reading this and then hearing Patrick Tall speak this. And it's just like, boom, right in the solar plexus. Yowch. Yeah. And especially after, you know, I sort of looked up the Venice Preserve like you and thought, whoa, whoa, very dark turns all the way around. Yeah. And gelding a man without hope or reprieve. That's a theme that we've had for, from aging male characters in the past. Interesting that Stephen coupled pudding with March pain. March pain is one of the dessert treats that Stephen Sturr served up for himself and Laura Fielding in Malta in Treason's Harbour a few books ago. Oh so there's a little bit of self-confession, I think, there as well. Wow. Well, Stephen does his evening rounds and Jack picks up again with his letter back to Sophie. He tells her about the gunroom dinner, describes praising Mrs. Oakes how she never let the silence descend despite there being three sullen officers at the table. Jack describes to her how he had begun to be oppressed by a set of shocking ideas. And Mike, this this realization on Jack's part is being built up little by little and you know almost in passing as we go through the chapter here. We, he doesn't say right away what the shocking ideas are, but we learn as he writes in the following paragraphs. He says that he grew nauseous as he grew more certain. And this is very unlike Jack Aubrey. Jack Aubrey doesn't talk about or experience anxiety gnawing at his innards over a new realization. He talks about living in the moment, and that's his character. So he says he wishes he could speak to Stephen about his messmates, about the other officers in the gunroom, but he knows that Stephen has too great a contempt for informers. He doesn't want Stephen to inform, but knows that Stephen, who once again is a deep old file, Stephen knows these men, knows mankind, and maybe he's ahead of this. Jack is realizing that he, Jack, had been a little bit behind the curve, didn't realize how quickly the ill feeling in the gunroom had grown. Can't believe that three grown men, officers and professionals and gentlemen, had sat around the table eating and not saying a word. Oakes is devoid of grace, as he says. Davidge had, in air quotes, fallen down the companion ladder, but that bruise looks more like he's been hit with a mallet or with a man's fist. Jack thinks that maybe either West or Oakes had hit Davidge, and that raises the specter of just how out of place had Clarissa's innocent question about dueling become. Jack is not sure why he believes it, but he says no one would call Mrs. Oakes very pretty, but she is certainly good company. And there's a real strong echo here of Stephen's letter to Diana earlier on. Now, Jack is writing more or less the same thing back to Sophie. All the other men seem to be getting involved in some kind of intrigue with Mrs. Oakes. I'm so pleased that I'm staying out of it. And they're both a little bit lacking in self-awareness, I guess, at this point. Well, Jack goes on to say that it doesn't matter anymore that she had been a convict, that he had seen that in prison, that after you're shut up long enough together, you know, the original differences no longer matter. He says the surprise is mostly white, but the Diane had been all different face, all different skin colors, and no one noticed over time. And by the way, they were all blue when they crossed the horn. And yeah. he says yeah. that just that way, Mrs. Oaks is now a surprise. She's also a good listener. She's interested in sea stories. And 
all of the men except one are hideous and that most women would recoil from them, but she does not. Now, Jack believes what Cousin Diana had told him, he writes, that there's a coxcomb, that is a vain and uh, you know, conceited person in almost every man, no matter how unlikely. And he believes that these men have misinterpreted her kindness as liking and are now absurdly jealous of each other. He says that this is not only a bad thing in and of itself, but it's going to especially hurt West and Davidge's chances of being reinstated because Jack's certainly not going to use his interest for them or write as their captain, you know, a a letter of recommendation if they can't control their passions. Mm. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, (laughs) hot hot meat the kettle. Jack, you know, I I can't recommend these people if they can't control their passions. Well, Jack, you know, uh, I resemble that remark. Jack should be thinking. (laughs) Well, Jack thinks Mrs. Oaks started the hair of the topic of duels running with the best of intentions, he writes. I I don't necessarily Ooh. think so. Yeah. But, he says, Davidge, who hadn't been talking until that point, started then talking a lot about the impossibility of putting up with an affront. So it looks like that there, that match lit, you know, a fire under Davidge that now he's got to get some, you know, he's got to get some payback for this affront that he got. And yeah. Jack is comforted a little bit in that, you know, the ship has been so idle for so long. And now with this upcoming gale, he's got the chance to keep everybody busy and hopes that by the time the gale blows itself out, they'll have come to their senses. Otherwise, he tells Sophie, he's going to have to take stronger measures. And we've been talking all the way through the, the canon about the emerging strong leadership qualities of Jack Aubrey. And it's really agonizing that he's just not quite there. He hasn't got enough perspective to see this. He's in a tricky situation with the the little bits of inside knowledge that he has. And he knows he's going to have to take action. But you've got to wonder, is he going to take action in time before something really terrible happens in the society of the gun room here? Well, there's there's a little comic interlude here as uh, he listens in on Stephen's struggle to get into his cot. And he's commenting on this into the letter that he's writing back to Sophie. He says that Stephen had turned completely over, somersaulted on top of his head earlier on, and wonders how it can be that he's survived at sea for all this time. And having put the letter down, he then decides that he's going to try to read his estate papers. And he has that thing of, you know, when you're falling asleep and you read the same sentence like four times and go back to the beginning, he realizes it's time to to sleep. But he can't nonetheless. And he thinks, here comes the quote, it is true that Clarissa Oakes is not really pretty. But how I wish she were lying here beside me. And there's the big discovery that all the males in the crew seem to be having right about now. A moment later, he slipped out of his cot, put on shirt and trousers and went on deck. A dark, dark night with warm rain sweeping across from forward, four hands at the wheel, west leaning on the barricade amidships, most of the watch under the break of the forecastle, He walked aft and stood there, looking at the glow of the binnacle and the white water racing by under the frigate's lee. And in time, the strong wind and rain, blowing his long hair out behind like seaweed and soaking him from head to foot, calmed his spirit. End of chapter four. <laughs> And for me, this is a, a relief. I'm thinking when when O'Brien says he swings out of his hammock and heads off in bare feet, I'm thinking, is he going to go and find her? Right. What kind of stupid thing is he going to do? What has he resolved to do? He's resolved to take him back into his professional home turf and be with the elements and, you know, take, a, take as it were, a cold shower, but on deck in the warm rain. Right, right, right. And I, for one, am relieved. Yeah, he's going to have the gale work the magic on him that he was hoping it would work on the crew. Right, right. yeah, that. yeah, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I was so convinced, you know, like a chapter ago, that we're headed off to this regional conflict. That's the story running. But it appears the real conflict is right here on the ship. And as you say, it's kind of getting more dangerous by the minute. Mm. You know, I'm I'm glad Jack is getting clued in. And like you, I had that momentary concern that he might possibly get sucked in. And maybe that's still a possibility. You know, I think it's always a good thing to get a reminder about what complete and utter fools we can make of ourselves when we're not careful. (laughs) So 
Mike, a whole other set of hairs running here, a whole other set of questions. We're, we're done worrying about Martin and his uh, and his benefices. That's taken care of. We haven't really thought yet about what's going to happen when we get to Moahu and the rulers there and how that's all going to work out. We've got much more short-term worries at hand, like what's going to happen with the gun room? Oaks and Clarissa ought to be married and ought to be happy, but there's no sign so far that the rest of the gun room are accepting that as uh, at, at face value. Stephen and Jack are going to have to do more than just play backgammon together to fig- figure this one out. Who's going to be the next person in the male groupings aboard the ship to either fall out with each other or fall in with Clarissa Oaks? And, and, and meanwhile, she's got a past. We don't really know why she has the personality traits and the habits and the slightly odd character ticks that she has. Maybe we're going to learn some more about that as well. I, I sure hope we do. I, that's you know that's really strongly on my mind again. You know what what part is Clarissa Oaks playing in all this? Is it intentional? Is it unintentional? And where is that coming from? You know, I I really hope we get to learn some more. Yeah. Well, Mike, I think therefore there's only one thing for it. What do you say next week to just a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? Oh, with all my heart. <laughs> head that they'd seen in a Sydney apothecary shop. Uh, I said that wrong, didn't I? Yeah. (laughs) In a Sydney apothecary shop.